Good morning or good afternoon where you are at and very warm welcome from Miami, Florida to more than 400 sites that have uh, signed in to listen to us live to our 2021 in-depth webinar. We'll now begin with module one, early ABC projects at the Connecticut DOT. We're pleased to introduce our speakers, Tim Fields and Mike Como. Tim, employed by the Connecticut Department of Transportation for over 36 years, has been the principal engineer for their major structures unit within the Division of Bridges since 2013. He is the chair of CONDOT's Bridge Standard Practices Committee, which manages and updates CONDOT's Bridge Design Manual. Since 2011, Tim has served as the State Bridge Engineer and voting member representative on the AASHTO Committee on Bridges and Structures. He graduated with a BSCE degree from the University of Connecticut in 1984, joining CONDOT in 1985 and advance, advancing through multiple positions in bridge engineering. He is a licensed professional engineer. <clears throat> Mike is a bridge engineer with over 37 years of experience in the design of steel, concrete, pre-stressed concrete, and timber bridges. He previously was employed by CONDOT in the Bridge Design Office for 13 years, where he designed some of the earliest use of, uses of ABC, including the first precast full depth bridge deck project in 1988. Mike has special expertise in the field of accelerated bridge construction technologies and constructability engineering. He is the principal author of numerous publications in the field of ABC, including the 2018 AASHTO LRFD Guide Specification for Accelerated Bridge Construction. He is a licensed professional engineer. Tim will begin today's training. Tim? Um, good morning. Uh, Mike and I are going to share this presentation. Um, Mike, as you know, as was stated, uh, was an employee of uh, CONDOT uh, during the uh, uh, 1980s to 1996, and uh, is going to speak about two uh, early ABC projects for which he had uh, a significant involvement with. So, um, so for those of you who may be unsure where Connecticut is, uh, we're a very small state up in the northeastern uh, uh, portion of the United States. Uh, we've circled it right now here on this slide so everyone can see where we are. So how did we get into ABC? Uh, the spark that really started uh, ABC was the uh, uh, collapse of a span of uh, the Mianus River Bridge in 1983. This is a uh, bridge that carries I-95 over the Mianus River in Greenwich. Uh, uh, the state had not been doing a great job of uh, you know, bridge maintenance uh, uh, for several years prior to this uh, due to uh, uh, some uh, pretty significant funding uh, limitations. However, that changed with the collapse of this bridge. An emergency bridge program was uh, quickly initiated uh, with wide uh, public support. Uh, the, the cost for this program was a five cent gas gasoline tax per gallon that was uh, 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 quickly initiated. Uh, this bridge emergency bridge program actually addressed about 50% of our bridges. Uh, um, uh, many of these smaller bridges, uh, and th the addressing was either replacement or rehabilitation. Uh, ABC was uh, a, a concept that developed out of this, uh, out of uh, uh, design necessity um, uh, due to li limitations and the urgency for some of the need for these early projects. So the beginning of ABC in the U.S., uh, this was also uh, helped to kickstart our ABC. Uh, some of these uh, initiatives that are listed here were uh, developed well after our 1983 uh, emergency bridge program and the two uh, deck replacement projects uh, we're going to hear about shortly. Um, so um, I, I would say for us, uh, Everyday Counts was probably w one of the, the biggest initiatives that helped uh, Connecticut uh, uh, deploy our ABC um, process here in a, a more systematic way. Um, we, you know, it, the early two projects that we did did not really result in a, uh, a paradigm shift. Um, it really uh, was around the early 2000s where uh, ABC really took off for us. Uh, I think the Utah DOT uh, 
program and Mass Start Accelerated Bridge program were uh, two to air two uh, states that we had something to learn from at that uh, during that early time. So as I noted, the first two uses of accelerated bridge construction were in Waterbury and Seymour. Waterbury. Uh, 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 the mixed master Route 8 I-84 mixed master is a stacked interchange, and there was a we had a major rehabilitate uh, bridge rehabilitation project there, addressing over 24 bridges in one in construction contract, and what, one of those required a bridge deck replacement uh, with a very uh, poor uh, detour uh, option. The next one is uh, Route 8 in Seymour. This occurred several years later after the Waterbury uh, uh, mixed master was well into construction and Mike's going to speak about that. We had two uh, bridges, uh, one a thousand feet, the other 1700 feet of uh, uh, viaduct structures that needed uh, bridge decks with uh, uh, limited shoulders, uh, ABC uh, with uh, using pre-gas deck panels became an obvious uh, option uh, for design given the success that the Waterbury Mixmaster project uh, was demonstrating. So uh, Mike, at this point, I'm gonna uh, switch over to you because uh, I'd just uh, like to know, you know, th this was, uh, these two projects occurred during Mike's uh, involvement in, uh, uh, with work at the uh, Connecticut Department of Transportation. Uh, Mike uh, was in state bridge design and actually uh, fully uh, engineered the, uh, the uh, Waterbury uh, Mixed Master uh, ramp and also was uh, uh, guided the uh, design of the uh, Seymour uh, Bridge uh, deck replacement projects. So Mike, over to you. Okay, thanks Tim. Um, Tim and I were both junior engineers at this time in the 1980s working in this bridge program. It was an exciting time to be working at a DOT when we were literally increased our number of bridges we were designing each year from something like 10 to over 300 per year. So it was an exciting time uh, and we had some exciting projects. So today we're gonna go through two of those exciting projects. And as Tim mentioned, these are projects that went with ABC out of necessity. So I can get the slide to advance. There we go. As Tim uh, mentioned, we refer to this as the mix master. This is a uh, uh, interchange of Connecticut Route 8 with Interstate 84 in the town of Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, it's a major interchange, has 29 bridges. And in the 1980s, we did several major rehabilitation projects. Uh, the photo on the right shows what some of this looks like. And it, it is like a smorgasbord of bridge styles. Uh, we have steel straddle bents, concrete straddle bents, uh, two girder systems, stringer systems. We have everything on this project. And uh, in this interchange, I should say, a part of this project involved the replacement of a deck on one of the ramps. And it's uh, shown in the yellow circle to the left. We'll zoom in a little closer. And here's uh, what the bridge looks like. It's Interstate 84 uh, eastbound to Route 8 northbound, which is a single lane exit ramp bridge. And as you all know, uh, you go to replace a deck on a single lane bridge, it can be a challenge to do staging. In reality, you couldn't stage this thing. It was just too narrow. So we, we needed to replace the deck. And uh, the only option was to close the bridge and, and detour traffic. And the detour was not very good. So uh, this is where uh, the concept of maybe looking at precast was something we needed to study. So here's a shot showing the bridge, an aerial shot. It's a six span bridge. Uh, it includes pin and hanger assemblies in one of the spans. So it's a complicated bridge. Uh, it is a curved bridge with straight girders, which also complicates the problem. Uh, we decided to pick a complicated one for our first precast deck, but uh, this is the the, uh, the hand we were dealt in the card game. So uh, we were given this bridge as a deck replacement. And as you can see, it's a very narrow bridge. <laughs> So how do we get started? Uh, how do we get into this? And really, uh, Connecticut DOT had been a member of the PCI Northeast Bridge Technical Committee for a few years at the time. Uh, this committee was formed in the 1980s to uh, standardize use to precast across the Northeast. Uh, we were a member of the committee. Actually, at that time, I think it was called New England Bridge Tech Committee. At that time, we've added New York State since. Uh, we were doing a lot of work with precast box beams and slabs. They were very commonly used. So uh, the, the boss who worked in our unit, Tim and I, uh, they came to me one day and said, uh, we, need, uh, we need to replace this deck fast. Can you do it in precast? And my response was, yeah, probably. We'll, we'll figure it out. Let's figure out how to do this. Uh, it seemed like a, a reasonable solution. But we had never done anything like this before. So uh, the, the way we got started was an informal research project ensued. And this is just a snippet from the, the uh, research project. Uh, actually wrote a paper for the International Bridge Conference where this was taken from. 
which gave a synopsis of what we uh, researched. What's great about the United States is we, we share details among states. We, we share successes. Uh, we copy details all the time. And what we did in this research was essentially was look at what was done across the country to date in 1989. And we basically grabbed all the good details and maybe set aside the ones that maybe were not so good. And we came up with a system. What's really cool about this is that a lot of the details that came out of this research are still in use today in the United States. So it was a, a very successful research project. And I give credit to these early users of Precast who uh, paved the way for us to do this successful project. A uh, quick synopsis, Indiana did a, a Precast deck on a through truss. They had all kinds of problems with leakage in the deck. They were using rubber gaskets with longitudinal post tensioning. They also had issues with seating of the panels and the stringers. They didn't sit quite, uh, quite properly. They had a lot of grouting that had to be done. Uh, so there was leakage too. So really we learned from the Indiana project that uh, some details that didn't work all that well. New York Thruway did some significant research on composite action using blockouts and shear studs, which we are still using to this day. Uh, they showed you could get full composite action. Uh, California did a project uh, where they used the concept of leveling devices to set grade on the precast decks. So we grabbed that as well. And then Federal Highway had done research on connections of precast elements using post-tensioning, and that came in handy as well. So the conclusions from the research is that we could get composite action with blockouts. Uh, the preferred connection between panels was a grouted shear key, and that post-tensioning was a, a good way to connect a precast deck using a post-tensioning force of 250 PSI which by the way is still in the ASHTO uh, LRFD. So it's just a, some early work done by Federal Highway and others to come up with that number. And then leveling bolts combined with a grouted haunch, haunch could provide a, a proper grade alignment, get our profile correct. So as far as the information, we showed the photos before. It is a six band structure with one continuous span in the middle uh, with pin and hangers. Uh, the deck panels themselves were pre-stressed transversely and post-tension longitudinally. We wanted a durable deck. Uh, we built this bridge in 1990, or I should say the deck in 1990. We specified a construction schedule of 120 days, and we had an incentive clause in the contract. Uh, and the maximum incentive was paid out at 42 days. So that's exactly what the contractor built, which is a testament to incentives, that they hit the maximum incentive of 42 days, and the bridge was opened in 42 days. Uh, there really were no construction problems. Uh, I actually went on vacation the, one of the first early weeks of the project. This is before cell phones. I think I might have had a pager at the time. And, it may have been before that. But I never got a phone call because it, I came back from vacation and they were already on span three. So it really did work out well. Again, a testament to the details that we gathered from around the country. Here's some of the details. Uh, this is back in the early days of CAD. Uh, again, you, we're all probably familiar with some of these details, and it really hasn't changed much in the last, uh, in this case, uh, 30 years. One thing we did learn from our experience with adjacent box beam bridges is that if you take four, if you take 10 four foot wide adjacent box beams and lay them out side by side, you will not get 40 feet. It'll be usually more than 40 feet because of the tolerances. Uh, things like sweep tolerance and flat tolerance of a precast concrete deck uh, element. So we learned from that and decided that we needed to have a system that had adjustability built into it. And the way we handled that was uh, having closure joints or closure pores at the end of the span to accommodate what I like used to call dimensional growth of laying out a number of panels. And that adjustability was key in the success of this project. Uh, the, this bridge was curved, so these panels were actually shaped trapezoidal. And we had three different uh, styles of precast with the blockouts in three different patterns. And so the, they, the actual blockouts would stagger uh, across the top plan as you went across the bridge. And uh, it made it easier to fabricate as we had very similar panels. Uh, as far as details, uh, this is some of these details are not in CAD, uh, but you can see the longitudinal post tensioning using an oval duct that was used. Uh, the parapet, we decided to go with a parapet that was cast over, extended over beyond the edge of the deck panel to just give a nice clean edge to the outside of the bridge. And again, the shear connector pockets are uh, pretty standard to uh, even use today. So some photos of the construction. These are kind of grainy photos because they're really old. You can see the date on them, 1990 uh, construction. Uh, and uh, the contractor used timber decking to uh, catch debris because there are roadways below the bridge and actually a pedestrian walkway below the bridge. And you can see uh, the dem demolition was complete in this photo. 
And then erection of the deck panels uh, progress very uh, smoothly. Uh, if you look at it, it looks like this thing is not very flat. And the answer is it is not very flat. This deck is actually on a 7% grade going downhill. Uh, so there was concern the panels would slide. Uh, the contractor put some blocks to keep the uh, panels from sliding around, which was really not a problem. Uh, but you can see the post-tensioning blockouts uh, for the connections of the post-tensioning duct. And the parapets were cast in place. You can see the rebar coming out of the panels. You can also see the leveling devices sticking out of the top of the panel. Again, a detail that's fairly common today. As far as post-tensioning, uh, the uh, following the erection of the panels, the transverse joints between the panels were grouted, and then post-tensioning was pushed through the tendons and tensioned one strand at a time. Uh, pretty simple. I call this post-tensioning 101, very straightforward post-tensioning. And it, was take, it took about two days per span to both uh, install the tendons and tension them and grout them. Following that, well, this photo on the left shows grouting the joints, which was done before the post-tensioning. And uh, the photo on the right is the, one of the closure joints at the end of the span. It seems like an awfully wide closure joint, but that was actually above a pin and hanger assembly. That, uh, we couldn't run the precast over the, the pin and hanger assembly because of the plates that were involved in that. But um, one thing you'll notice, though, all this post-tensioning and grouting is done before the shear connectors were installed. Uh, we didn't want to induce a positive bending moment into the structure by having uh, post-tensioning be applied after composite action was made. So up until the post-tensioning, this uh, slab was essentially floating on the leveling bolts uh, prior to the, the grouting of those blockouts for the shear connectors. Here's a photo of the completed bridge. Again, a very grainy picture of some very old cars driving across it. I love these photos, uh, just showing the age of the bridge. Uh, again, built in 1990, and uh, really, it went very smooth. We had no real issues with this structure at all. Uh, again, a testament to the quality of details that we gathered from around the countries and the people who came before us. So I went back after 20 years. These photos are after 20 years of service. It's now been in service for 30 years, and uh, we're we know it's in the same condition today. And the key thing we were looking at is leakage through the joints, and there is none. That uh, We did use a membrane waterproofing system and asphalt overlay on this bridge. Uh, and then uh, combined with the quality of the post-tensioning and the grouted keys and the uh, the uh, wearing surface and the, over and the waterproofing, we're not getting any leakage through the joints. The photo on the right looks like there might be some staining. That's actually overspray from the painting that occurred after the deck was placed. So really, we had no issue with this bridge uh, whatsoever, even after 20 years of service, and it continues to be in the same condition today. So we're really getting durability out of these structures. That was the first project, so we move on to our second project. Uh, we had such good success in the Waterbury project that now we said, let's take this thing up a level or a notch or two. And this, this is a very challenging project. This is my hometown of Seymour, Connecticut, which has a uh, two very long viaduct structures that run through the center of town. Um, the, they're curved structures. They're all simple spans. As Tim mentioned, the first, the south bridge is 1,000 feet long with variable width with ramps, acceleration, and deceleration lanes on it. That's the photo on the bottom. Photo on the top shows the northern span, which is 1,700 feet long. Again, a curved structure, uh, all simple spans. Uh, but it is, uh, luckily, that bridge, the roadway is parallel through there, so we didn't have the, the uh, variable width. Again, all simple span structure, and we needed to replace the deck on these, these two bridges. So the challenge is, is that we wanted to go with weekend construction only. As you remember, the first bridge took 42 days to do six spans. We figured, looking at that success, that we could actually replace a span in a weekend using this system. And that was the, the challenge. And the challenge was to close half the bridge every weekend and have the contractor give the one half of the structure to the contractor each weekend. Uh, and you had to really work from top down because access, as you can see from below, was rather difficult. This is location plan showing where the bridge is. As Tim showed before, it's in uh, uh, southwest Connecticut. So the approach... Again, to build on the successes of the uh, I-84 bridge, we use very similar details. Um, the key was to close one direction Route 8 and give the contractor one whole side of the structure each weekend. Um, the uh, bridge barriers were cast after the weekend. The idea was is that we put temporary barrier in the shoulders, reopen the bridge on Monday morning, and then work on the barriers during weekday uh, off-peak times, like at night uh, when traffic was low. This saved a significant amount of time. Not having to cast barriers made a big difference in the weekend work. Uh, the contractor, to, to meet the project schedule, had to do multiple spans per weekend. And they were doing up to, uh, I believe, three spans per weekend when they got rolling. And this bridge was built in two construction seasons, one for each direction of the, 
of the uh, highway above. A couple details showing the staging. Uh, again, we we did a crossover and put one lane in each direction on half of the structure and then gave the contract to the other half of the structure. And you can see the hatched area is the precast section that was put in. Temporary barriers were put in place on uh, Sunday night and that was the work area then was reopened to traffic on Monday morning. So we, we drove on uh, the precast panels for the entire first year. And at the end of the season, uh, the entire span was uh, waterproofed and, and uh, um, waterproofing was put on and asphalt overlay was put on at the end of the season. Just a plan showing some of the details as uh, a couple things that we added to this project that were not involved in the waterway project. Uh, we had a roadway crown on some of the sections, so we ended up using longitudinal closure joints, which I can pick up with the pointer here. We have these longitudinal joints running the length of each direction. Uh, there was a open joint in the middle of the structure, uh, but basically we added a crown detail to handle uh, the roadway cross slope. The parapet details were similar to Waterbury. Um, again, those parapets were cast after the weekend construction. So the second panel project was another complete success. It was a very challenging project. Uh, contractors did a wonderful job working this project to get it done in time. Uh, there were no significant issues. We, uh, there were a lot of little minor issues like any project of this sort. Anytime you turn up the, uh, the heat from a 42-day project to a three-day project, you can imagine there's a lot more uh, pressure on the contractor, but it was a, su a successful project. Uh, we also have looked at the inspection reports for this bridge, and it's doing very well as, as, uh, as the uh, Waterbury Bridge. So we learned a bunch of things in these first two projects. One, that we could build things very quickly. Uh, two, precast concrete could be used for bridge construction. And three, what we learned more than anything is the use of quality details uh, were imp so, so important to get excellent service life out of these structures. And uh, seeing these structures in service for 30 years now, uh, the condition, we have no doubt these structures, these decks will last. Uh, my my uh, uh, feeling is they will last 75 years, the full life of the structure, because we really are seeing uh, really quality uh, durability out of these two structures. Again, the key is it's always good details. I'll turn it back to Tim now to finish up this presentation. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Mike. And uh, I, I think one, one thing that uh, uh, provides uh, great service life with our bridge decks here is the uh, the use of membranes and overlays. Um, uh, you know, that was instituted uh, as a standard practice uh, uh, in the late 70s here, mid to late 70s. And uh, our bridges that have been built with, um, with uh, waterproofing membranes, uh, those decks have performed uh, very well for us. Um, so the current ABC program development, uh, these two early uh, examples here uh, helped to pave the way for uh, later work that uh, followed. Um, in Connecticut, we never had a problem here with uh, uh, upper management resistance uh, to ABC, accelerated bridge construction. It, it had really uh, been favored. It was um, in kind of an incremental process though. Uh, you know, after uh, Mike left the department in uh, the 1990s, uh, there, uh, I would say there was probably a little bit of a lag in the full implementation here uh, and push uh, to use accelerated bridge construction on a more routine basis. Um, another aspect of this is cost, and we really haven't, uh, in these two examples here, we we didn't discuss cost per se, uh, ABC, uh, typically is going to cost a little bit more uh, in upfront costs and construction costs. And as uh, you're going to hear in late, later presentations, there's uh, uh, some savings that typically would go with ABC with uh, much shorter uh, con uh, contract durations. So again, we uh, our early program was done without a decision matrix. The decision matrix, which you're going to uh, be presented in the following presentation, is a tool that, that uh, we uh, developed to help uh, objectify the uh, decisions to go with ABC or not. And right, right now, I think uh, another key uh, for these ABC projects, and you'll hear uh, again on this, is getting um, uh, the uh, buy-in from our stakeholders. Because uh, typically, like in the Seymour project, in the Waterbury project, when you take uh, uh, ramps out of service in Waterbury for any period of time, there's a uh, cost to pay for our users and uh, uh, detour around 
we didn't show you the detour there, but it was a lengthy detour and the Waterbury uh, uh, ramp replacement. Uh, Seymour also had, uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, high, highway um, impacts during those weekend closures for two years. Uh, I'm sure there were buildups, but uh, with, with the uh, traffic buildup. But one of the keys here, and you'll hear more about this, is uh, people, uh, once they understand uh, what's on the table, adjusting their schedules to help take load, reduce uh, traffic loads. So uh, uh, I, I, at this point, I think we're going to conclude this uh, uh, presentation for module one and take any questions. Thank you, Tim and Mike, uh, for your presentations on the early ABC projects at the Connecticut DOT. Very interesting and uh, great history there. I'd like to now turn it over to Paul Lyles, former Georgia State Bridge Engineer, who will be moderating the Q&A sessions, assisted by Ahmed Abu Hawaj, Chief Structural Engineer with the Iowa DOT, both of whom are members of the ABC UTC Advisory Committee. Paul? Okay, Mary Lou. Uh, yeah, this is Paul. Um, and uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, the first one we have is, uh, what were the lessons learned from your first precast deck panel projects. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll, I, yeah, I'll start with that. I think, yeah, the, uh, some of them I covered in the presentation, but I, I'll reiterate them because they are important. Uh, the first thing I remember, literally, I remember talking with the design crew. And the first thing we talked about was we have problems, not problems. We're aware of when you would put adjacent precast panels together that you get issues with dimensions and growth. And uh, so our assumption going into the project is nothing is perfect, nothing is exact, and we need to account for that in our design. So the key things was the, to account for tolerances in the elements uh, by having joints between the elements that were adjustable and to have closure joints at the end of the bridge to adjust for uh, growth of the overall length of the deck and then to have a haunch with leveling devices so we can set profile grade perfectly. Uh, the early projects, in, especially in Indiana, they had issues with both of these, uh, getting the panels to seat properly, getting the proper grade. Uh, and we, we just learned that uh, we needed to have adjustability built into the system. And, and again, I'll just say the details we took, we didn't invent many details for this project. We were standing on the shoulders of people who had done work before us. Uh, and, uh, and we just put together a system based on the early work done in other states that come up with a system that had adjustability and uh, and um, had details that were proven to be durable. And uh, that's the key to success. The key to success is always detailing. It's detailing, detailing, detailing. Okay, Mike. So, I mean, uh, you, do you still use the same details today? Yeah, we, we do. Yes. Uh, we are kind of moving away from post-tensioning with the advent of UHPC now. It seems to be becoming a more popular thing in the United States. But in the Connecticut, you're going to see later on, we'll talk about another more recent project, which it's basically the same details. So, yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, here's a question that came in during the presentation. Uh, for Seymour Viaduct, was the asphalt wearing surface removed on the entire bridge prior to replacing spans? Or was the new deck set at the same elevation as existing wearing surface to allow traffic flow during the week? Wow, that's getting down in the weeds. Uh, <laughs> I can't recall. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would I think we would have had to been there, Mike. Oh, I think yeah. so, too. I think they stripped the deck before we started. Yeah. Or they, they might have ramped down. Honestly, Paul, I can't remember. It's a long time ago. Yeah, that would have been a pretty uh, uh, significant uh, uh, drop-off between the... Uh, uh, the overlay and the bare deck. So I, I, I'm guessing we we would have uh, stripped that down. That would have been uh, common to uh, do uh, at that time, and that's typically how we would do a uh, bridge if we were just doing a deck patch yeah. membrane overlay project. Now, one thing we did learn, though, is we did drive on the bare deck for the first season until the end of the season, and we found out very quickly that if you were to use a bare deck, you'd have to do diamond grinding because it is a rough surface. Uh, so we drove on essentially a washboard for the first uh, uh, portion of the project. But uh, uh, I always call the overlay is also your last tolerance adjustment when it comes to profile. If you got a rough surface, the paving makes everything nice and smooth. So, uh, yeah, we learned that, too, that if you were gonna ever going to go to a bare deck, you'd have to do diamond grinding. Okay. Uh, here's one uh, that came in as the pre-webinar question, and this kind of leads into our next uh, thing, but it says, how was the ABC program initiated? I think you kind of mentioned that with these two projects. 
And they said, is there dedicated funding for the ABC program? Now, you mentioned the five cent gas tax. Is there any other funding, and, and is that uh, tax um, still in place? That, that, that tax is uh, not, not in place per se. Um, I, I would like to say the, uh, you know, our, a, our ABC program has uh, been the, basically the incorporation of uh, ABC decision making in our projects here. So we don't have a dedicated uh, program just for accelerated bridge construction. Uh, accelerated bridge construction is a design alternative that's explored during pre preliminary design. Uh, so, you know, our, our program per se is basically the encouragement uh, that, that we offer, that we provide, that's uh, supported by upper management here at CONDOT to uh, uh, seriously consider accelerated bridge construction in, in all projects now that involve uh, deck replacement, uh, superstructure replacement, or entire bridge replacement. In Connecticut, uh, we have very high, uh, you know, tra traffic densities on our highway systems and uh, we, uh, that means there's not typically shoulders to uh, move traffic to on, on major uh, highways, uh, uh, major hi uh, bridges I would say uh, that are in the 1960s vintage. Many of those have uh, inadequate shoulders to carry traffic while working on the uh, bridges and it's not just true for uh, the interstates, it's true for many bridges of that vintage. So uh, in Connecticut goes to great lengths to try to accommodate our, our especially our weekday commuters. Uh, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of grief where we have not done that. So it's, I think accelerated bridge construction has worked hand in hand in trying to mitigate traffic impacts, uh, construction impacts on our, our highway users, uh, particularly during uh, peak travel hours. Okay. Uh, we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask Ahmed if we've got any questions that came in after we started the question and answering. Ahmed? Yeah, Paul. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, were there any issues with the deck panels laying on multiple girders in terms of weight distribution? Uh, great question. And uh, uh, we do, we were concerned about that. And leveling devices actually serve two purposes. One is they set grade, but they also do deadlift distribution. So we had a specification that required the torque on the leveling bolts. I believe they, they all had to be within 15% of each other. So between keeping the torque relatively equal and the cross frames on the bridge, we felt that we were getting proper deadlift distribution. It's a good question. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, assuming that the post tensioning was done first and the, the blockouts were grouted, what are the advantages and disadvantages of post tensioning after grouting the shear stud blockouts? Okay, I'll take that too. That's something we consider during design development. Obviously, and every time we do one of these decks, the contractor asks, they want to grout everything first and then do post tensioning later. Uh, what that does is it induces essentially a positive bending moment into the superstructure because of the eccentricity that post tensioning with respect to the neutral axis. So uh, obviously, in most cases, that's not going to be uh, desirable. Uh, sometimes you can get it to work. Maybe we've talked about doing that for continuous spans and negative moment regions to actually get a positive bending moment. But in reality, in most cases, we do want to do the post-tensioning before composite action is established so we don't induce that positive bending moment. Thanks, Mike. I think it's 40 after the hours, uh, the hey. starting time for the next module. 